We can hear you. Let's see. Testing mute function. Mute. Unmute. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Can you hear me, Hibba? I can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Um, Sweet deal. Yeah, we're just doing a test recording right now. Is that what you're doing, Mark? Uh, I'm no, I'm just recording. I'm just going to start it and then I'll clip it later. Okay. Uh, one second. I didn't. So, uh, how are you doing this morning? Hibba? Oh, I'm great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for asking. Oh yeah. Just drinking my coffee, you know, trying to wake up. Okay. <laughs> how are you, Mark? Good, good. You're right. She does have a California accent. Oh man, you caught me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I do too. At some point, I think, yeah. After ten years, it's probably rubbed off on me. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so just just waking up every morning and seeing what like new amazing things the fucking assholes in the IOF have done is uh, it's 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 the you know you should be used to it by now but you you it's just not you not no, it's it's a gift that keeps on giving fucking christ yeah yeah i swear it's like a horrific episode of hunger games oh man fuck every morning waking up the yeah. same old bullshit yeah. except add one more layer of bullshit yeah it's it's, <laughs> it's like uh, underneath every rock bottom for them, there's a trap door. <laughs> That's right. It's so dystopian. It's it's so dystopian. It's the <laughs> fact Wait, it, what, the, what the fuck is dystopian? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it dystopian or dystopian? It's dystopian. It's dystopian. Yeah, because dis oh. was the god of misfortune in uh, Greek and Roman mythology. Really nice. I thought it was dice. Why did I think it's dystopian this whole time? Hey, I, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna edit that out. I knew it. <laughs> I knew how to say it. What about hey? This it. is kind of like come on, guys. This is like the difference between milk and milk and pillow and pillow, right? <laughs> yeah. So we can't can't hammer on him too hard. <laughs> okay, you're right. No, I'm just kind of a language Nazi because it makes me feel powerful <laughs> and right. <laughs> All right, matter, so I'm gonna edit it out. Yeah. All right, so uh, how this is going to work is uh, intro, and then friggin' we're going to play a Bernie Sanders video. And, uh, you know, we're just going to jump right in and see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to start. <laughs> all right, hey, hello and welcome all to episode two of Colonial Outcasts. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Greg Stoker, and I'm here with Mark Wayne. Um, we still haven't done an intro episode and we're not going to because there's a catastrophe going on and I feel like I can't spend too much time talking about it ourselves. And we're joined today with my friend Hibba, uh, Palestinian, um, and my friend who's, uh, been educating me a lot on this conflict and for security reasons, she wishes to remain anonymous beyond the first name and a voice. And I would enumerate on said security issues, but it would defeat the implementation of the security procedures in the first place. So um, today we're going to be discussing a number of things. Um, liberalism, uh, how it manifests in everyday life and interactions with people who identify as liberals and uh, within the context of Palestine and the ongoing conversation that kind of always relates to a two-state solution. Um, so yeah, uh, we'd like to welcome Hibba. Thank you so much for being here with us today and giving your perspective on that. And thank you for having me, Greg and Mark. Yeah, and uh, you know, living in a, a certain part of the country, I'm sure you are exposed to this kind of liberalism that we're talking about and that we're going to expand on later uh, all the time. 100%, and we're talking about brand new species of this neolib persona mm -hmm. yeah okay so uh we're just gonna like dive right in um mark if you want to to roll the bernie yeah let's bernie, roll it. the bernie thing all right let's think see what you think of this we have to give hope to the palestinian people they are living they were living before october 7th in a disastrous situation in Gaza, 75% youth unemployment, massive poverty. And right now in Israel, 
you're having the Netanyahu government, an extreme right-wing government with racists aboard, trying to make it impossible for a two-state two solution in the West Bank. They're killing settlers there. So what we need is the world to come together to give hope to the Palestinians. We need a two-state solution. I want to just clarify one thing, Senator, if I might. You support a humanitarian pause in Gaza. Some of your fellow progressives say that there should be a full-on ceasefire, which would require an agreement on both sides to halt the fighting. Do you support a ceasefire? And if not, why not? Well, I don't know how you can have a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, with an organization like Hamas, which is dedicated to turmoil and chaos and destroying the state of Israel. And I think what the Arab countries in the region understand, that Hamas has got to go. So what we need right now, the immediate task right now, is to end the bombing, to end the horrific humanitarian disaster, to build, go forward with the entire world for a two-tier, two-state uh, solution to the crisis to give the Palestinian people. Uh, All right, I think, I think we've got <laughs> enough of that. Time now for the... All right. Oh. Okay. So do you just want to open this up, Hiba, and just send it? Like, what's your initial yeah, reaction? Yeah, like, oh, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. So the thing, the thing is, we were all on board for Sanders when he came through with whispers of Palestinian rights back in 2016. Mm -hmm. The whole bird landing on his podium at the Oregon rally and him making that comment that this bird is actually a dove <laughs> coming to ask for world peace. I mean, we all fell for that show and drank his Kool-Aid willingly. Mm -hmm. But then, like, I'm just going to say it like it is. Mm -hmm. I, we feel like he cuckled at us. Yeah. Like, he just straight up threw us under the bus. Um, so since the war started, Bernie has basically reduced himself to these, like, half-beat socialist, liberal Zionist fence-riding ideals, calling for a two-state solution and being murky on ceasefire language. I think the most triggering part of it all is, like, when white and Arab leaders and politicians come up with their, like, two-state solutions, thinking they're, like, revolutionary and progressive, Yes, yes. Let's go ahead and solve the problem by deciding a two-state solution is just inviable. Except it's simply not. It's just upholding the status quo. Mm -hmm. Another form of apartheid under the guise of a separate Palestinian demilitarized state. And I don't want to get into that. Maybe I'll let Greg touch on the effects of demilitarized states, or maybe that's a conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th that's exactly what it is. You know, I... I I grew up hearing whispers of the uh, two-state solution in my elitist, like New England liberal bubble that I, you know, grew up in as a kid, and that's exactly what it is. It's just maintaining the status quo to make certain people feel like, you know, they're not supporting apartheid and justice, but they don't really have to, you know, sacrifice any skin or put themselves out there. They're just like, we just really need a two-state solution. Uh, we've got spin class later. For me, that's kind of what that en en encapsulates what th that narrative means for me, from my perspective, from the other side of the curtain, you know, on this issue. Yeah, you, uh, I thought it was interesting. You were talking about, um, you know, I want to go back to Bill Clinton. Yeah. Like, you can see this type of white savior mentality. Um, and even the way he looked, remember when he was doing, uh, what was it, Camp David? Was it Camp David? Yeah, I or, think so. Uh, and he's holding throwing him back to Camp David. <laughs> and, and 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 Bill Clinton is 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 having the hands of Yasser Arafat and uh, the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, and he just looks like, yes, I did this. I created this piece. It's this you can actually see it in his face. So it's this sense of it's not so much the the desire to help people being oppressed. It's the desire to be seen as the guy who did something great in history for people to being oppressed. That's what it is. It's just the having the legacy of it and not really having actually like real effects, you know? Yeah. And, and that kind of trickles down to the average, like, you know, liberal who, who just espouses the same ideas, but like really doesn't accomplish anything. They're just like, I'm on the right side of things. I'm talking about a two state solution, even though it's like geopolitically non viable. It might work, as we talked about uh, last episode in Iceland, you know, who's just an, basically an island nation uh, protected by NATO. So it doesn't need a military. But, you know, the Middle East is a different region. And uh, what coalition is going to band together to, you know, defend Israel? Oh, it's fucking, I mean, the U.S., Palestine. Uh, that would be, what, the Gulf states? I mean, it's just a, it's just a disaster from the get-go. 
like e even countenancing that from a geopolitical perspective. It's just unworkable. Yeah, the Gulf states are not to be trusted with our safety. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't even need to go into that. It's just like blazingly obvious, at least the governments, you know, they're completely uh, complicit within the uh, Western imperialist system and they do not want to be viewed as uh, nations of the global South. Yeah, because what was it like? Uh, didn't didn't the King of Jordan just come up and do like a speech on a two state solution? Basically, with Joe Biden in the background, he was all squirming and yeah. uncomfortable with the language. Yeah, <laughs> I just saw that. Yeah, because he's he was like he did say explicitly ceasefire, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he did. So he took it one step farther than Bernie did, basically. Hey, hey yeah. we're almost there. A hundred days later, thirty thousand people dead. Hey, we're making progress. We're finally saying the fucking word ceasefire. Yeah. Know? Well, I mean, at least, at least someone is, but like, I mean, they can say ceasefire all they want, but like, there's, there's no pressure. It doesn't seem like for Israel to accept a ceasefire right now. So, um, I think the fact that, you know, liberal politicians, like even AOC, who's, uh, brought up, you know, Palestine's suffering before, uh, was silent for like a hundred something days. And even now she's still like saying like, we got to do something about military spending and people are being murdered every day in Gaza, but she even won't say the word ceasefire, but it's interesting. They can't say ceasefire, but they, they, they can say two state solution. So what was the uh, memo that went out uh, within Congress and in Capitol Hill, where there's a memo that went out officially that says you will not say the words calm, you will not say the words ceasefire, you will not say the word, you know, take, you know, uh, being reasonable. Those there's there's were certain words that were banned on Capitol Hill. Do you guys remember that? It was a memo that went out officially. All the politicians were told not to use the word ceasefire. So they're abiding by these unofficial memo rules that were written by somebody and spread around it was on the news so you know yeah um but yeah i mean just going back to like the policing of language and stuff that kind of is not exactly the liberal idea that well that liberalism was founded on so um we at the beginning of this episode uh hibba we uh touched on these like these everyday uh, liberals that you may uh, e experience um, and like, how does that manifest and how do you not trust it? Yeah. So going back to me as a Palestinian American, um, I've been active in the Palestinian liberation cause my whole life. And I have to say there are like a whole new species of neoliberal white girls that have been violently burst after October 7th. <laughs> and so there's, so there's basically, it comes down to like two kinds I've, I've, I've come to, to find. Mm -hmm. uh, the first kind are the ones who've got their social media profile pics with their faces fully covered in kufiya resistance style, throwing upside down triangles in their bios, paraglider emojis, you know, the whole nine yards. And these are the ones who are there to like fetishize revolution and get some brown boy pats, mm -hmm. you know. And then there is like the second kind who are uh, the super performative chicks who co-opt liberation movements and the quote kafia challenge February girls wear your kafia every day for a month. These are the same women who were the first snap photos wearing BLM t-shirts for the height and duration of that movement. Mm -hmm and then moved the fuck on to the next trending thing once that trend faded, which is problematic as fuck, right? Yeah. Because marginalized people don't have the luxury of treating these movements like trends because our existence depends on them. So basically I came up with a term that describes these two types of neolib white chicks. I call them atrocity tourists. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, that's fucked up. But <laughs> I mean, I think, that's fucked. I think it's kind of apt, you know? Yeah. As fucked up as that sounds, they sort of like dip in and out of the proverbial atrocity wagons to fulfill their white savior complexes as needed. It's a really weird internet flex. Well, it, it kind of stems from also that trend of going to Africa where a white girl will go to Africa for a quick, you know, weekend trip, take a picture with some, you know, African kids in a poor village. Yeah, and then building a school. And then, and then do the safari ride, you it's, know, on the it's weekend. Called, yeah, it's called voluntourism, I think it's called. Voluntourism. And yeah. uh, it's it's very common. So it's kind of like that. Now, question for you, Heba, is how do we differentiate that? Like, how do we distinguish 
who's doing that and who's genuine in the movement, who's genuinely, you know, in solidarity doing, like, or whatever. In solidarity, their heart's in it. Like it genuinely touches them when they see this stuff and they want to do something about it. I feel like it's kind of hard. I guess it's hard to tell at first, but basically you kind of like have to see what the persona is. Like if the persona is this person who bandwagon hops, obviously they're just there to be an atrocity tourist. If the person, you know, based on their work and their social media accounts and their history are actually, you know, like wholeheartedly in, you know, liberation movements uh, and helping marginalized people and not co-opting their movements, um, you know, that's, that's kind of like how I can tell. And really like it, it boils down to like how much skin in the game do you have? Are you willing to lay it all on the line? Are you willing to go balls to the wall uh, for this, to lay down your reputation, you know, rabble rouse, get in I trouble. I think I have some uh, freaking connection issues. Line, you know? yeah. So that's kind of how I see it. Do you see a change in behavior of these types of women when it comes to publicly coming out in the sense of feeling the, the fear of being ostracized, you know, like, uh, like by whatever, like say, say they're going to university and they're afraid that they're going to get, I don't know, doxxed or, you know, disbarred, whatever it is, fired from a job. Do you see that kind of thing where it's like, there are certain lines they don't cross because they don't, you know, want to fully put it on the line? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, this is part of the whole neoliberal thing that we're talking about, right? This whole new thing. It's about, it's about performative activism. Like it, it, it goes to a certain point. And then when it comes down to their personal safety and, and their, uh, um, what's the word? Like their livelihood. That's yeah. where the, you know, the hard line is. Yeah. Yeah, and this kind of like segues into it's something I definitely wanted to talk about. It's like um, when it comes to this, uh, also this neoliberalism neoliber uh, and the atrocity tourism and this performative activism that we've been talking about, you still see at the end of the day, a lot of people, even within the like American focused pro-Palestine movement say like, I know Joe Biden's bad, but like, you know, do you want four more years of Trump? Like think about that yeah. Arabs like Trump did the Arab ban and like what happens to bodily autonomy with if Trump gets reelected, you know, uh, that's a, that's been a whole conversation. So I was just wondering if you could expand on that as well. Oh, you're asking me. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I should use. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough for, for us or for a lot of us, it's not either or right. It's like, you know, there's this whole push right now on either Trump or Biden, like it's one or the other. Well, a, a lot of us feel like, no, we're, we'd rather withhold our vote, um, even if that works against us in the long run and or, you know, vote, um, you know, Dr. West or Jill Stein, you know, what the other parties have to offer, depending, you know, on, you know, how it, how it pans out in their, um, in their own spaces as we get closer to the elections. So it's, it's tough because, I mean, I don't know, I'm not going to speak to every Palestinian, obviously I can't do that, but a lot of us are sort of like, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do the either or conversation. Like we're not even going to have that conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the uh, you know, the other thing I was thinking of is just the, um, wow, oh, I lost my train of thought, the, the this guilting of people who say I'm not going to vote strategically like this idea that you have to vote strategically, not morally. You don't vote with your ethics. You don't vote with your moral morals. You vote with, you know, strategy. I see that happening in, uh, especially white liberals. And what they do is they, they gaslight, uh, minorities or people of color or people who are passionate about an issue and saying like, it's like, yeah, but you're giving a vote to the other guy. You know, and they and they constantly guilt them, you know, while at the same time shoving democracy down their throat. It's like you got to get out and vote. Like that's how you show your voice is you get out and vote. And then he says, OK, well, I don't want to vote for Biden because I think he's, uh, you know, he's promoting a genocide. He's supporting a genocide. I don't want to vote for Trump either. It's like, yeah, but you're giving a that means you're giving a vote away to Trump. 
You know, what's funny is- Right, my so Matt, that actually worked on us in like previous elections. So for me specifically, I ne didn't necessarily want to vote Biden, but then I was in the wagon of being gaslit into don't waste your vote. It, yeah. One is better than the other, yeah. go that way. But I feel like at this point in time, we're talking about hardline being genocide. A lot of Muslim Americans, a lot of Palestinian and Arab Americans are not going to be gaslit. Like there's a hard line now. It's like, we're not going to vote. We're not even going to be strategic. We're done. You know? Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, yeah, good. I've been, I've been arguing with white liberals about this issue, not just about, this is long before the, you know, the October 7th. And it's just this constant, like patronizing tone they take when you talk about voting with your morals. They're like, yeah, but you know, it's like, yeah, but you kind of, it's like this, this, this patronization. And I'm just curious is when pro-Palestinian supporters or Palestinians, when they tell white liberals, no, fuck that, <laughs> fuck Joe, we're not voting for him. What, what is often a pushback that you've get, that you've experienced? Can you, can you go into that? Honestly, I have experienced that. And as a Palestinian, like in the backdrop of the genocide, when I say, fuck no, don't like, this is a, this is a hard line for me. Like I'm not even gonna have this conversation. They just back the fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, <laughs> plain and simple. I mean, they're, they are also like very conflict averse generally. I mean, that's kind of a stereotype, but um, or at least personal confrontation averse, but yeah, I mean, uh, I just get this general sense that, you know, they, they care more about, you know, maintaining their own rights and privileges within this country, which is, you know, understandable on some level than they do about, you know, our tax dollars uh, going to slaughter people um, on the other side of the planet. Um, yeah, like we don't have the privilege mm -hmm. to make that kind like we don't have the privilege to, you know, make those kind of decisions. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it, it's not there for us. So it's pretty black and white. Mm -hmm. And this, this also kind of is why I'm so bothered by the tax, the rich movement in a sense, not because I, I'm a simp for the rich where I give a shit about the rich. The point being is that they'll say tax the rich, but not say a damn word about the money of tax, the taxpayer money that goes to the Pentagon. That's the part that gets me about white liberals so much is billions of your tax money are going to the genocide, but they'll just ignore that. Just say tax the rich. We need to tax the rich. It first fix the fact that our money is going to kill people. Our money is literally being siphoned to go kill people. Solve that first, then talk about taxing the rich. And that's the, that's another thing that bothers me. It's it's uh it's one of those fallacies that they go down. But I think that that's going to come out more of how ridiculous that sounds when you say something like tax the rich without saying anything about the money that's going to the Pentagon to kill people overseas. Yeah, and you know that's kind of what I was thinking about. Like when it comes to like voting Democrat or Republican, I do believe when it comes to foreign policy, we have a uniparty system. All right. Yeah. Like we have these domestic issues about like, you know, doing revisionist history in schools in Florida being like slavery is a choice or, you know, freaking out about tra uh, transgender rights or, you know, drag queens reading to uh, kids. It's all these uh, engineered uh, domestic issues that are like culture war BS. But when it comes to foreign policies, like these aid packages being approved for like that just passed the Senate. Uh, to give like 60 billion to Ukraine, another 20 to Israel, um, that still has to go through the house, but it passed today or uh, yesterday. Um, and that was a bipartisan bill. Like these Democrats and Republicans, they vote the same on foreign policy issues almost across the board. Like they, they vote on these arms deals. They, they vote on Senate appropriations for uh, the military, for the intelligence community uh, to give out, to, to award defense contracts to Boeing, Raytheon, and General Dynamics. They're essentially, they're functionally the same party because they get lobbied by the same individuals. They get lobbied by APAC. They get lobbied by the defense industrial complex. They get uh, lobbied by British Petroleum and the ener energy sector. So they are kind of, for me, who focuses more on foreign policy and geopolitics than I do on domestic, uh, I, I, I fail to rec see a significant difference, you know, because there are also Democratic politicians wanting to be part of the whole bomb Iran bandwagon that's been going on since the, like the 70s or 80s. So, yeah, 
that there's that too. So like liberals, liberalism, yeah, but like effectually it's the same party when it comes to foreign policy and you know how they're dealing with the genocide in Palestine or you know the Houthis blocking up the Gulf of Aden. It's indistinguishable for me. I want to go back to what he was uh, Bernie Sanders was saying in that video. Yeah. So he, on one hand, he says that BB is an extremist, far right extremist, and the government of Israel is far right extremist. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, no shit. And then it's like, no, no, no. But what they're doing, what they're doing in Gaza, no, that's they need to do that. Like that's the part that boggles my fucking mind. Like if you and I have friends like that who are liberal, they're white liberals, quote unquote, and they say, "Oh yeah, Netanyahu definitely needs to go. He's crazy. He should go." I was like, "All right, so they should stop what they're doing." Guys is like, "No, no, no. He needs to do that. That has to finish. Like after he's done with that, then he needs to go." Like what the fuck are you talking about? The bombing in Gaza and BB, you can't separate the two issues. They're the same. The person responsible, the regime responsible for making the decisions that are dropping the bombs are the people that you are saying needs to go, but you're approving of the dropping of the fucking bombs. It makes no fucking sense. That's the thing that gets me so much. It's like, I don't give a shit if you think that BB needs to go. It doesn't do anything. It does absolutely no good, unless you're gonna say that what he's doing also needs to fucking stop. It makes no sense. So I this lip service that we give, like, oh, BB's a right-wing extremist government. Yeah, he's, he's bad for Israel, and we've been saying that. We just, ah, he's just, He's just so frustrating these days, and it's like, then tell him to fucking stop bombing kids. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's Let's like well, you're, you're condemning. Yeah. I don't give a shit if you condemn the man. If as far as I care, you can love the guy. Just stop what he's fucking doing and get rid of his regime. Love him when yeah, he's on vacation are, in retirement. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so you know, yeah, these are these are typical liberal Zionist talking points mm -hmm. where. You just can't separate. It, it's the same. It's the same as Bernie Sanders saying, "Oh, there's you know." Instead of actually speaking to a ceasefire, he specifically says, "Well, there's no ceasefire with Hamas." He fails to separate the Palestinian people from Hamas. Yeah. So you have the same, the same thing going around and around. It's the same thing. It's this liberal Zionist bullshit. Yeah, that, that you made a good point. That it, here's the thing, in their minds maybe maybe they're being liberal because in their minds the all the palestinians are hamas so they're not against palestinians they're just against hamas but in their mind hamas is all the people dying in gaza so yeah if you're going to equate it, it, even under that logic you know that he's saying that you know we it, there can be no ceasefire without without hamas it's like that's not what's happening though that is not what's happening. What's happening in Gaza isn't the eradication of Hamas. It's the eradication of civilians. Hamas is doing fairly strategically well right now. So yes. who the so so this? It, it, but, but it's a great cop out. It's an it's a, such a great ingenious cop out because if you can just whatever's happening in Gaza, all the bloodshed, all the stuff that we're seeing, if you can just label that as a war against Hamas, yeah, you can get away with your argument. You know, no, yeah, but but you'd have to ignore all the video footage, all the thousands of reporters and all the millions of people who are saying it's a genocide. You'd have to ignore all that in order to say that comment. Well, also, it, it does allow them to be like, you know, it, we need to stop killing civilians in Gaza. But like, also, we can't have a ceasefire with Hamas. It's like, first of all, Bernie, yes, you can. Uh, obviously, you freaking can. So th they're just saying things that they know are patently untrue. Uh, just to maintain the status quo, and that's why I, you know, because it serves it it, it serves them. Um, like the I think, it, Greg, I think it boils down to like the the empire not wanting to show the world that they're willing to negotiate with quote unquote terrorists. Mm -hmm. Um. So at the end of the day, it's like if if they actually want a political ceasefire, a political uh, solution which is to have a ceasefire, you're gonna to have to negotiate with the resistance party, correct? Yes. So, and, and that's gonna basically show the world where, hey, look, the empire, the West, they're willing to negotiate with terrorists. This is the new you know, precedence that we're setting here. And I think that's why you keep hearing this, you know, there's no ceasefire with Hamas, there's no ceasefire with Hamas, and we're not gonna get anywhere until they actually, you know, come down off the high horse and actually come up with a political solution where 
they are going to have to negotiate with Hamas because at the end of the day, that's the governing party of Gaza. You know, they're, they're not just a militant group. They are also the current government there. So that needs, you know, anyways. Yeah. And, you know, the, the great hypocrisy of that is, you know, we, we also label or not we, uh, I need to start separating myself from U.S. government policy now that I'm out of the military and no longer agree with it. But, um, you know, the, we uh, they consider uh, Hezbollah and the Houthi to be terrorist uh, organizations as well. But they still have special envoys and like diplomatic channels uh, associated with them specifically to hash these things out. So uh, it, it's it's a patent lie that we won't negotiate with terrorists. We've been, we've been doing it since 2001. Like we now employ like ex Al Qaeda guys. Um, so <laughs> Islamic state. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so uh, it's just performative hypocrisy main to uh, what uh, meant to maintain the status quo. And, you know, liberalism is kind of what birthed the idea of like modern empire, you know, the, cause endemic to that was like, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, you know, uh, international institutions like the United Nations that were supposed to keep like global order. But the fact that they they can't really uh, stop a genocide really just goes to show that like all these liberal ideals and liberal institutions that were based off of a philosophy uh, that was birthed in the 1600s, 1700s really only work if you're white and you're Western. And, you know, they're basically meant to maintain power structures. And that's why I've always maintained that white nationalism, which is generally a far right movement, is just the same side of the same coin. It's just a different side of the coin for uh, liberalism as well. And you cut and you can also see that evident this this uh, the, the fact that it's two sides of the same coin in the in the treatment of the, the topic of surrounding hostages. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. so Hamas has how he, they originally kidnapped how many hostages? How many how many was it? 200 was it 250 I think it was like 250 or something like that yeah okay and how many children does uh, uh minors and women and elderly are in um, detention camps administrative detention roughly in the thousands i believe right something like that yeah right Don't so have... okay all right so you want to let's let's set the stage you want to talk about hostages okay a lot of my white liberal friends were talking about that's all they're focusing on would return the hostages we have to get them home okay okay F fair Fair, completely fair. Now, but is that where the conversation ends? You just stop right there? You're not going to talk about the thousands of children and women who are in detention camps and in, 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 uh, being raped every day, being tortured, being starved. We don't know what's happening to these people because they don't allow cameras. They don't allow journalists. They don't allow uh, documentation of what's going on. And if you do do documentation or you try to do it, what, what do they do? They, uh, they'll shut you down and label you as a terrorist. Okay, so... If you're going to talk about hostages and you're going to focus on that, you, you it's to me, it's so asinine to just talk about the 250 hostages who are kidnapped, which is terrible, but then not talk about the thousands who are in a black hole somewhere being God knows what happens to them. There's so much and, and we know what happens in these detention camps, uh, in these in these administrative facilities. We know it's rape, everyday rape, everyday torture, starvation, all kinds of psychological torment happens. It's a pure sadism every Absolutely. fucking day. And so if you're going to talk about hostages and not talk about that, like Greg said, that shows that there is one factor that's playing out here. And that is the color of the skin. At the end of the day, it's the Western, a Westerner was kidnapped, a Western or, a, or, you know, somebody of the elite class, somebody who's not in poverty, somebody you like know, me. Somebody, and that's scary. Somebody, yeah. Somebody with somebody my skin like. Color. Yeah. Somebody like Ukraine versus, you know, right. Palestine. there's that, that whole thing. I mean, you we were seeing these uh, pictures of like women bunkering out with making mol homemade Molotov cocktails. And yeah. people were like, look at this female strength. hero. The strength, oh, the resistance. Strength. Uh, Jesus Christ. They're you know, so creative, like <laughs> too. They're 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 welding the uh, uh, the artworks that to stop the tanks like they're working together as a society. Um, and then you talk about the ass uh, at the at was it the Aslov Brigade, the, the Nazi the, the ass, brigade. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, the Aslov's yeah. like, oh, no, 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 that's a small group. It's a small group. It's just, yeah. Like, but like, yeah, it's 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 just the the manipulation. Aren't of the they being like 
mercenaried out like parts of that brigade in Gaza. I mean, at yeah, least they are. That, that was the rumor. absolutely yes. They are. They are. Uh, there's mercenaries. Asimov. Asimov. Yeah. Asimov. No? Asimov. A a neo Nazi, a neo Nazi unit is working for Israel. But that's not new for them. <laughs> no, not not at all. And uh, just yeah. it, it's a Azov brigade, by the way. Just so we don't get as off as a, as long. Oh as man! Long. Yeah. Yeah. Just so as just as so we don't get slammed in the yeah. comments. Slam. Uh, <laughs> We're gonna get slammed by a Ukrainian. It's like it's pronounced Azov. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> no, so um, yeah, and and also it just it, it's it's a thought terminating thing. Uh, just to say, like release the hostages or only speak about the hostages because they they don't. A question for one second like why you take hostages you take hostages pr primarily for two reasons ransom to support a war effort which you know hamas doesn't need to ransom anybody because they get plenty of funding uh and then two for political concessions you know and uh speak i was never on a hostage rescue team i wasn't like in special operations long enough to do the really high speed stuff but the thing is like you only attempt a rescue operation if all diplomatic and negotiation possibilities have been attempted and the fact like that's just like basic ass doctrine because they could go so wrong you could lose the hostages it could cause an international incident uh so the fact that that like most basic tenet of like hostage rescue and hostage recovery doctrine is just completely ignored in this whole conversation it's like no no, no. if you want the hostages back actually from a military perspective you do everything you can to do it diplomatically and through negotiation so and that's that starts by not bombing the, the shit out of region everybody. yeah blindly using an ai program about where they are <laughs> like that that's that's step one step one is don't bomb the hostages that's yeah. that's what you do and then except yeah. the ai program like sucks hardcore and apparently is just indiscriminately killing well yeah, yeah. If, if you look right. at where the bombs were dropped in terms of concentration it, uh, you know and you overlay it with population densities uh, like pre-october 7th it basically dropped it basically just overlaid a population heat map over the city and dropped that so it's like not even advanced ai apparently yeah it's not doing anything it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's there's no yeah it's just dropping a heat map um but you know i think there's a lot of uh when it comes to you know liberals that I you know grew up with and I, I experience and I try to engage with the whole Palestinian thing uh, and I bring it up like even with like Uber drivers and stuff like one thing I realize is just like you know I, I I know what's going on there so so badly but I just need to like take care of myself and my headspace and like because you know, you can't really solve anything or take care of anybody else until you take care of yourself first. <laughs> ah, yes, so, the self care. So yeah, yeah. That liberal. Is so goddamn true. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, my life's a fucking mess, dude. Like, I'm a goddamn train wreck. But you know, I, I mean, that whole thing's a freaking cop out, too. That that they, I see it all the time. Privilege. Yeah, it's, yeah. That okay. Yeah, that's called that's called privilege. You can you can. Have, you know, afford to uh, be part of the uh, P S uh, L G G something. Oh, C. Yeah. P S L W G C. That's the organization that they're all part of the pumpkin spice latte white girl coalition that, you know, really just who are, who are now them. vegan. They're vegan now. Yeah. Um, they went vegan in the past year, which is laudable because animal cruelty is a real thing. But then again, there are yeah. is there's an active genocide going on, and I, I think one of the most telling things is like when it comes to a lot of these uh, liberals, it's like the, the fact that Greta Gerwig, you know, wasn't nominated for an Oscar after she did Barbie. Um, that was a catastrophe. So it kind of seems like when it comes to this kind of thing, it's just like these types of liberals are only there to like support other types of liberals that are similar to them. It's like almost very tribal in a way. Uh, I want to talk about, and I, I'm, I'm wary about going into this, but okay. I'll, I'll, I'm, that's why I'm going to pitch, the, you know, uh, chalk this up to Hebo. I want to talk about pink washing. If you can. Can you? Okay. 
Well, hmm. if you're, if you dare, if you dare, because <laughs> it is, it, about that one. it well, yeah. it does, it does go in the, it's, 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 it's the latest uh, weapon of uh, white liberalism, in my opinion. The idea, right? Of but I mean, it, from like from our perspective, I and mean, it's all very transparent, right? Like they, you know. Oh yeah, you know it's it, it's basically the same as saying, oh, you know, in Israel we can wear bikinis and we're free, and in Gaza if you wear a bikini, you know, you'll you'll get thrown Your in head jail. Off. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, and so it's like, but then but then you have soldiers, you know, rifling through Gazan women's, uh, you know, negligee and posting it on social media. Yeah. So, um, but when it comes down to like pink washing, yeah, I mean it's it's quite transparent. It's like. Well, clearly, we we all know that you know Israeli culture is not you know accepting to you know the LGBTQ community. They just put that on as like a guise. You know, it's part of their whole come to Israel. We've got you know very free gay people and this, this and that. And oh, well, on the other side, there is you know these barbarian Palestinians who who cannot have. You know, gay people in their communities because they'll they'll be killed by Hamas. You know, so yeah. to us, it's, it's sort of like quite like we we kind of see through that. But you know, obviously, this is all just part of their uh, you know commercial to come visit Israel and be free and you know the foreign implant in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, and, and like you bring up like pink washing and like you know uh, respecting LGBTQ rights and stuff is a big part of like modern day. Uh, this neoliberal and liberal ideal. Like, personally, I identify politically as more of a leftist than that, uh, a liberal. So, like, yes, I'm still all about that. But um, that's a big thing, like the pink washing, but also art washing is massive as well. So, um, what art washing is, is basically using the arts to like elevate like Israel above, as uh, Hiba said, uh, the barbaric Palestinians. So like, we know that museums, especially in New York city uh, have been getting like van uh, essentially like vandalized. There've been protests right outside of them because these museums all about the culture and the arts, these elitist liberal institutions are also completely, um, complicit within this uh, whole genocide uh, enablement speech because um, one example of art washing that Israel does is film festivals. So there's a big film festival in England, you know, yearly, um, and they present um, like a lot of like Israeli indie films where, you know, they present this multicultural pluralistic society that's like a dem dem uh, democracy and um, they're like very civilized and it's a way to manipulate again like pink washing western audiences who have these liberal values and they're thinking oh wow that culture is like us and, you know they're a democracy they're pluralistic egalitarian uh so yeah we should definitely support them and and that's also leveraging post 9-11 propaganda, you know, to say that, you know, it takes a village like Muslims are prone to terrorism and, you know, they they aren't like us at all. So it's that that's another aspect of mobilizing liberal values to do, uh, accomplish what they want to accomplish. And little little do they know, Greg, that, you know, with a basic Google search, you'll find that the literacy rate in the US is what, like 79 point, I don't know the exact number, yeah. <laughs> but it's like in the seventies. And then if you look at the literary, literacy rate in, in Palestine and Gaza, it's like 99 point something percent. Right. So yeah. you're you're talking about this whole, like you said, the art washing, the, I mean, they're just like, yeah, you know, we're civilized, we're, we're the Aryan nation, we're this perfect example of, yeah, of colonial, it's, you know, yeah. It's a romanticization uh -huh. of it. And I want to talk, we can't talk about this unless we talk about that bullshit letter that was written. We all remember that, right? Tell me you guys didn't forget already about the letter that was written by all these Hollywood actors and actresses oh, yeah. thanking Biden, thanking Biden for his wise decisions on Israel. And, w and that was a huge shock, I think, to the world. I think that is going to be one of the final straws when it comes to celebrities and how we prop them up on this pedestal as being the moral voices for peace 
Um, the and you had surprising names on there. You had fucking Jordan Peele. That was a huge bummer for well, me. Well, that was a big was, one. Yeah, that was a big one, and I was disappointed. Like I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, look at your movies that you make. It goes against completely against what Israel is doing, you know. And but thank God, uh, thank God you had the um, you had uh, to give credit to what, what I would say is like the not the white liberals, but the the you know the. You know the white warriors i would call them was dozens of a i'm reading an article right now dozens of uh entertainment industry a-listers signed a letter urging president biden to push for immediate ceasefire and that was back on october 21st so this is early on and that was john stewart of course awesome guy i love the guy um huge fan i take a lot of inspiration from him uh you know hassan minaj of course so you had a lot of you have the opposite so you have white and then you have white yeah warriors. but like I, i've got a lot of fil- friends in the film industry and that's like th- some of those guys are too big to touch and it's basically not the pulse of hollywood and, and the thing yeah, is no 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 yeah, doubt yeah that's, that's a small mind it's the brave because one. hollywood is just performative at the end of the day yes. they're basically no. whores they will go oh yeah to whatever you know they're pushed to go to they'll follow the money and that's just the way it is yeah and and i I think uh hollywood especially hollywood celebrity in general is kind of at the apex of what we've been talking about it's right it's like they get up to accept their award they're like save the environment we couldn't film in canada this year so we had to go to south america because there's just no snow anymore that was like one of that was like one of like leonardo dicaprio's like oscar reception speeches like years ago um but like at the same time yeah i mean like do do you want to fuck with the production companies do you want to piss off the casting director like you know toe the line yeah Yeah, i mean let's let's look at you know all of the 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 liberals who are recently in upheaval about taylor swift's carbon footprint in the backdrop of a genocide i mean like for fuck's sake (laughs) i know we'll just look at the pure insanity that happened like regardless of where you stood during covid you know, some people can imagine where I stood. I thought the whole thing was fucking bullshit. But that's me. Me and we'll argue about that some other day. Where I, I don't know yeah. what you were there. We'll, we'll put that. We'll, put that on. We'll the put show. that on the side. But yeah. uh, look at the outrage that happened during COVID. Look at on both sides, whether it be you know the um, the 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 huge push for humanity during COVID, right? That huge push for humanity during COVID and the guilting during that. And then here you have a fucking genocide. Silence. And it's like. I, like I think Greg said it best in his speech in Austin, where it's like Palest- Palestine has pulled back the veil. It's definitely pulled back the veil, and white liberalism is one of the last veils that's being pulled back. Like we 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 knew the corruption in in politics, we knew the corruption in Washington, we knew the corruption in the Israeli government, in the Arab states, we knew the corruption there. We all had hints about that, but I think one of the veils that was not pulled back yet, quite yet, was until this you know at what's happening in gaza at that point white liberalism was one of the last veils to be kind of pulled back like oh you guys are full of shit too you guys don't give a shit about people you don't give a shit about humanity it's all a fucking pageantry yeah you know so that's yeah so like growing up in a new england boarding school like i knew it was bad but i didn't know it was like this bad and this supremacist. yeah i don't this, think any of us did i didn't know it was this supremacist until yeah yeah know, october it's um, it's it was only a whisper it was only a rumor it was only jokes that dave Chappelle would make see dave yeah. Chappelle, i i gotta give credit to the guy i love the guy a lot of people love him because for this very reason uh, dave Chappelle, he says a lot of things that people would find be find offensive and you know discriminatory fine yeah. but the main reason why they love him is because he calls out white liberalism he calls it out you know um the, and through his comedy and so and he, you show you, you see that through uh you know just the jokes that he makes about the hypocrisy of all this um from you know especially towards racism towards black people in hollywood um and 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 of course the palestinian he's been he's been vocal on the palestinian issue so he's been ostracized because of it you know surprisingly by by uh by the hollywood crowd but we love the guy so I, I do think it's important that we talk about the um, the uh, the polar opposite of white liberalism too, you know. In a ways, we do have warriors out there in the in the public sphere who um, have been the 
source of who have been canceled, quote unquote, before attacking white liberalism, but actually standing for humanity. And Dave Chappelle is one of those guys, you know. So it's interesting that relationship you have between people who are the opposite of white liberals, who are actually warriors, who go out there and they're standing for rights, regardless of where the winds are blowing. And then you have white liberals who hate those guys, but can't quite show up publicly. So they have to find some other way around it to attack them or some way to manipulate the words. It's, it's, it's form of jealousy, you know, and it's a form of insecurity that they don't have the bravery to do what that person did. So what do they do? They join the club, they whisper, they rumor, and then they throw attacks. So we see that too happening. So it is, it is important. I believe in this movement that we, show support for those who are genuine warriors who had to sacrifice that fame had to sacrifice that uh, you know because we have to recognize that you know i, I you know I, I i might have to like disagree with you a little bit on there because like yeah Go they have it. a fucking massive platform and you yeah. know people are being actively slaughtered with their own tax money i think speaking out and like risking a little bit of your ass like, it, yeah. you know, it's not a fucking big ask at all. You're I, right. It's like, not. you know, I it's mean, it's a big ask for them. <laughs> I mean, it, why? It, I mean, it, why? Because, like, well, because they've got already because, got 15, 50 million dollars in net worth. And, like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm yeah. sorry, dude. I can't get behind that. I don't have any fucking. I feel, no, no, I feel you. I feel you. I, it's, yeah. I guess for me, it's, it's just, but it, it does, you got to understand. It, it, you have to admit, though, it does feel it. All of us. It, it, it gives us some type of psychological relief to see the ones who did put their shit on the line and to it, it, it's at least something to root for in the public sphere, because honestly, we don't really have a voice in the public sphere. Like how many voices do we have in the public sphere that are like up there in the celebrity level? We don't have a lot. And if they are, they were pushed back down because they supported Palestine. You know? I don't know. Like, so, uh, I don't know. Like, Hibba, going forward, I mean, are, do do celebrities in general, or do they have the same weight that they may have had before for, for like, social activism? Celebrities? Yeah. I mean, in my... I mean, to me, it's always been, like, the same, really. Yeah. I just see them for what they are, you know, just performative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all performative, yeah. Like... I also don't think like the real social justice warriors are like looking up to celebrities. They're not, those. they're not, no, no, they're not. It, it, yeah. it is, it, it is sometimes it's like a little sprinkle on the, uh, on the cupcake. Well, though, sometimes the, the, only, all, the, the only reason they'd be important is because they'd get, they'd wake, you know, com completely complacent people up, uh, that mm. just exist with, you know, in their own privilege to be like, Oh, maybe, maybe something's wrong with this. Um, because like we're, we're so invested in what's going on right now, um, in, in, uh, Palestine that we forget that most people watch the fucking Super Bowl two days ago and they're just like, okay, yeah, fucking America. Like I fucking love drinking beer and, you know, eating nachos. But like, you have to understand yeah. that's most people. And yeah. Then, like I'm like, when you asked me that question, I kind of got dumbfounded for a second because I'm like, I haven't even been following celebrities. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like well, I haven't I, even yeah. you know, like the only yeah. person who really stood out to me was like Macklemore because he just literally yeah. from the beginning threw it all was. out there. He did. And, and he wasn't towing a line and to me that stood out. And the rest, the Selena yeah. Gomez is the whoever, the Scream Three cast or whoever, they were all just like towing this line of like the yeah. both sidesy discourse. And to me that's just like pff, I just I just close the screen and move on with my life. You know, I got more things, more important things to focus on. Well, you know? and, and I think that that's one thing that's a great change that we're seeing in our society is the, we're not looking up to celebrities anymore where we really aren't. I mean, well, I mean, people, at, at least I, I mean, like, circles. like, like at least the like white, white dudes and white gals uh, who somehow like cared about like, for whatever reason, care about what's happening in Palestine, maybe because they have a soul or they're not completely consumed uh, up their own ass with their own privilege. Uh, kind of, I know for a fact that some people still had some like celebrity worship and that's kind of gone away too since October. I've I, I noticed a trend in that for sure. And that's, that's, that's good because, you know, again, it's, it's all an aspect of like supremacy. So, and that is, but, but it is because it leads to fascism, which we're it seeing is in real time. 
So I, I, don't know, I don't know how much more I can speak about celebrities. I think I'm, I'm freaking done. I'm done with them because again, it, they, they are the apex of, you know, yeah. performative no, they activism, are. performative activism. Well, it, the, I, I always think about the hunger games when I see what's happening uh, in, you know, the Capitol, right? The, you know, when they go to visit the Capitol and you have all the wealthy elite sitting there in the crowd and you have that, you have that hint is a great caricature of white liberalism in how like, they're, you know, they're, they're dressing like, uh, artistically brave and they're pretending yeah. that they care. They're pretending they're pr uh, compassionate and you kind of see the same shit. At the this is a science. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. It's, it's, it's a, I, it was a science fiction movie, but it's like, you were literally yeah. seeing it with their own two eyes. The books, I, it's been a long time since I read, uh, the books and I, and I watched the movie a long time ago, but I, I think recently the author of that book had put out put out a statement saying that she, or I read it recently. I don't know if her, if her statement was recent, but um, she had said that she got, she was inspired uh, to write the hunger games by the war in Iraq, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I don't doubt it. The, um, yeah. And just talking about like the, the moral judo, that they use uh when it comes to the whole topic of the hostages i want to go back to that for a second so and, and just hamas like uh you know the, the, again the constant cop out is hamas 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 you can just throw hamas in there boom you can get away with any moral 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 fallacy moral atrocity just throw hamas in there so when bernie sanders was talking about well we can't have peace there can be no ceasefire if if there's still hamas but not saying anything about the Israeli regime. Because so let's say I, I I grant them that. Okay, let's say we 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 go down that road. Okay, we can't have a ceasefire unless, while Hamas is in power. All right, but we can have a ceasefire if the Israeli uh, the current regime, Bibi's regime, is in power. Who's 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 bombing the shit out of civilians? Yeah, who's, I mean, who's fucking killing thirty thousand? You know, over thirty thousand plus civilians. Yeah, I, I mean, we you're can, saying we that can, that regime can stay in power too. So if you're gonna say Hamas has to go out of power, you have to fucking say that the Israeli regime has to go out of power. But there's no yeah, talk about. I think that. what they don't realize. I think what they don't realize is like Hamas is an idea at this point. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um. So. <laughs> they're immortal. I mean, that's really they're immortal now. It's an idea. It's about, you know, even if they go and kill every single member of Hamas, like the, the you know, what, what are you going to be left with? A bunch of really like very upset people who are going to want to take revenge. And then you have an, the, it's the idea of resistance, really. Hamas is the idea of resistance, resistance to colonial powers. Really, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know that's inherently threatening to a bunch of interests in the Middle East because, you know, uh, we we can say that they want a ceasefire. That you can you can condemn Netanyahu's government all you want, but even going back to 1947, I have you know declassified CIA documents say like, hey, Palestine is quote a country a, a weak country with a, a disproportionate amount of material wealth and you know what's important to our national security and global security uh middle eastern oil uh so yeah i mean that you can say it's all about hamas but yes it's the idea of resistance to institutionalized colonialism and imperial and imperial power so um also um it, would you say hibba that uh hamas would is somewhat still popular despite all the uh all the destruction that the israeli government tries to pin on them in gaza you know i'm of course not going to speak for all palestinians but i mean there's there's mixed there's mixed views there's a lot of people on the ground who are like i just want to live my life you know like i don't want anything to do with this like i'm just a civilian truly uh -huh. and you know I, you know, like any government, like people not, you know, a government's not going to be representative of all, of all its people, right? Just like we have here, you know, there's Republicans and Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, after so many years of the same government, you know, a lot of people do want out of that government. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about the resistance faction and all of the resistance factions, because there's many, we're seeing more Palestinians supporting resistance in general, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they're Hamas or, you know, other resistance factions, you know, to, to meet their sort of 
um, ideals. Right. So, okay. Uh, I think you, you're, you, you've got to go. We're at the hour mark. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add that anything Hippa, that we've been talking about that you'd like to do any final remarks on? No, I have a few I questions think, for her. I think that I, was good. I, I got me? one. Qu- oh, yeah. yeah. I got a question for you. Uh-oh. Can you express to me in full honesty, the, some of the biggest frustrations you have on this mm-hmm. topic? like that you've personally experienced because yeah you know yeah. especially as a palestinian one yeah i think the biggest frustration is like allies who come into social spaces and like speak for us without like asking palestinians in those spaces like wh- what they want or with how they feel so people i get like allies are like super juiced and like really want to get in there and like show their support and like throw down and things like that but it's it it, there's like it it becomes like we've been silenced for so long that it's super triggering to have people you know in 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 a forum or in a discussion or on a thread just being like oh i think it's you know reasonable for a, a you know just throwing down like adjectives like this is reasonable and this is not reasonable for li- what liberation might look like for us. And I just, it makes me want to come out of my skin. You know, it's like, yeah. hey, hi, ask us what we want. Or like, you know, Saudi, Jordanian, like uh, kings who are getting up and shaking hands with US politicians on, you know, and plotting out the two state solution. It's like, what, what, ask us what we want. What do we want? You know, how do we see our liberation pan out? You know, yeah. you, everybody's just, you know, doing what's most beneficial for them without bringing our voices forward. And I think at this point, the most important thing is amplifying Palestinian voices, asking them what they want, you know, getting them out there to speak on how they view their own liberation process to look like. I think that's the most uh, you know, that's really what it comes down to for me. It's the most frustrating part. You know, PSLW do yeah. pumpkin spice, a white girl. Coalition, aside, yeah, yeah. Uh, that aside, I mean, that's also a frustrating performative activism. People like trending our cause when in the backdrop of like men collecting their children in, ba- in grocery bags, limbs and parts. And yeah. it, it's super dystopian. Like the cognitive dissonance and all of it is like, just because you don't have skin in the game, just because you don't have family in Palestine or that you've lived that experience personally, um, you know, doesn't give you a right to to go out and just wear it like a like a t-shirt. You know what I'm saying? And just take it off whenever you feel like it. So that's really the most frustrating thing for me, like performative activism, people speaking on behalf of Palestinians on what's reasonable or not reasonable, how they should resist or how they choose to resist. Yeah language around um language around resistance to like oh i am an activist and i'm pro-palestine and then when it comes down to resistance it's like the red line it's like you know that you know we're not down with your resistance it's like you know you can't you can't you can't uh, you can't judge a starving person's table manners. Somebody yeah, said that. I was about it's to say that. that. That's a great. That's a quote that I've been learning in the past few months that I never heard before. And it's a great quote. Could could you give? I don't know if you're able to recall. Can you give like a specific example of a very uh, close, like you know, within your personal sphere experience that you've had? Like if you can remember, I know there's you've probably gone through a dozen of them, thousands of them maybe. Um, but if you can pull out one example of a situation you had where you were just so fucking heated and you wanted to just rip that person's head off, like, I just want to hear, I want to hear you, I want to hear you go off (laughs) on a a situation. (laughs) I mean, it's really that it's like when people come in and are like, oh yeah, like I think, uh, what was it? I can't remember completely right now, but it was something along the lines of somebody somewhere was basically like. Oh, I think it's super, you know, uh, reasonable, like, uh, what I can't remember exactly what it was, but they were basically trying to say what and what isn't reasonable for our, you know, next steps forward and what Hamas is, you know, presenting to the West as like a solution. And they're like, Oh, well, I think, Oh yeah. The Hamas charter 2017, I think the newer Uh Hamas charter. Um, 
And I'm just like, dude, like get off your fucking horse. I get you're on, you know, on board, but like you need to, you need to ask us what we believe is reasonable. Even if we each have a very different opinion, every single one of those opinions is more valid than yours because right now what needs to be heard is our voices. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, yeah, especially when they, they didn't even know what like the West bank was or that Jerusalem was like partitioned uh, before October 8th, you know? Yeah. Like they're, they also, yeah, exactly. Their knowledge is starting on October 7th, essentially of like the Palestinian strife. They don't really know what's going on in, in the West bank, what's going on in East Jerusalem in tandem with the war in Gaza. So, you know, it's just, it's just super cringy. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it is cringy. A lot of this is just so much cringe going on yeah. in the in this sphere in these spheres. Yeah, especially well, I appreciate espe- you going yeah, up. especially with the uh, atrocity tourism. That's that's a great term, by the way. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> yes. All right, you got it. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this is going to be like our primer episode and a whole series about this because I've just scratched the surface about what yeah. I want to say about this. Yeah, we're going to get more academic in the future, but thank you so much, Emma, for coming on and starting us off. Absolutely. Send it. So freaking send right. it. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, I think we can cut. Yeah, let's do it. This is our second episode. Yeah. How'd you feel about the last one? Good one. Are we still recording? Yeah, still recording. Yeah, no, I, I can end it. I can I'd like. Here's the thing: when I record, it doesn't matter when I start recording or when I end it. I can cut it to start and end whenever I wherever I want in the whole thing. So okay, but, awesome. Um, hey, but there were nice parts where you guys were like, there were parts where you guys were like super glitching out. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be part of the sound quality there. Oh, don't oh. worry, don't worry about that because um, hey, uh. I know you're at work, so you can like mute it and stuff. But if you can leave after we end the recording, if you could leave the tab open, it will upload all your local video and audio files. So it, there will be no glitching. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just nice like, to meet right. you, Hibba. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. yeah, we could we could talk about this forever. I wish we yeah. could have more time and talk with you. So we um, okay, so let's end the recording because awesome. there's something I want to mention that's not going to be recorded.